located on the south side of Russell Street, Assessor's Map 10A. Um, it's by the Valley Development Corporation. They're proposing the redevelopment of existing 29,230 square foot hotel into 50 affordable permanent supportive housing apartments plus one resident manager apartment, as I said, at 329 Russell Street. Um, do, we is, are we, do we have someone here from Valley Development? You guys here? Um, so I, I guess just uh, to get things started, what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, the applicant make a presentation for uh, for the project. Then we will take questions from the board, comments from the board. Um, then we're going to open it up to, as part of the Chapter 40B process, uh, we take input from other boards in town. So we're going to open it up to questions and comments from the other anyone who's here from other boards in town. And then if there's time after that, we will uh, open it up for public comment. If we don't have time to make it through public comments, we you know we'll continue the hearing and have, have public comments at a at a later date. So, and does that make sense, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair? Yep. Um, Elisa Mead, Town Council. Okay. Um, I just uh, was the board going to have a discussion this evening related to the safe harbor. We were going to do the safe harbor. Should we start with that? Do you, do you recommend? Um, I, I think either begin with that or after the initial presentation, but before comments. So, um, but I, I do think the, the board needs to address that this evening. We can start with that, I guess, before we get into the details of it. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, as, uh, as part of the 40B process, 40B is a, um, as an affordable housing statute, that's a state statute. And as part of that process, there is um, a, a goal that the state has set of 10% for the, your housing inventory to be fall into the affordable uh, criteria. Um, we are currently at 12.5% as a town, roughly 12.5%. So we are above the 10%. The so um, we have the ability to, uh, to notify the applicant that we are in the safe harbor and that we do not have to um, accept the application for the affordable housing. So um, I have any discussion about that. Do you guys have any questions about that? Um, our two options are three options. We could not, we could not um, exercise the safe harbor and let them make the presentation, and then you know they would, you wouldn't be able to reject it under the safe harbor criteria. We can exercise uh, safe harbor and reserve our right to reject, um, and to, that would allow us to put conditions on the project. We can exercise the safe harbor and. Um, and deny the project uh, as because we're above the ten percent. Um, I think at this point, I think it makes sense. We're going to let them make the presentation and take public comment. My 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 feeling is I think we should exercise the safe harbor and allow them to make the presentation. Then we can decide at the end of the hearing tonight whether we want to move forward with the process or whether we want to um, deny the project. And that would be a motion to invoke safe harbor. Yes, motion to declare safe harbor and um, and then but allow them to make the presentation. So I'll make a motion to declare safe harbor. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It, okay, so so just, just as a matter of process, Mr. Chair and um, members of the board, um, so what would happen is at the end of the meeting, you can vote to authorize the chair, if that's the direction you're going to go in, to send notice to DHCD and to um, the applicant that um, you potentially want to proceed, but that you would invoke your rights of safe harbor. Or, or we would vote at the end of the hearing to, to deny the application under safe harbor? Correct. So this will serve as the notification either way, and then we, will, we'll, we would follow up with an official notification at the end yeah. of the... At we need to provide notification within 15 days of the hearing if we're going to invoke safe harbor, right? That's right. And and actually, you wouldn't actually deny tonight. You would do that at your next at your next meeting because you would have to get DHCD to approve that you, in fact, are in safe harbor. 
but you would you need to notify DHCD this evening and the applicant. So either way, we, we're going to notify about Safe Harbor, and then we'll make a decision at the end of this on whether we want to notify them that we're doing Safe Harbor with a denial or Safe Harbor with a decision to move forward. Correct. Okay. Uh, we have uh, someone from Valley Development. Are, are, you, are you guys on the Zoom to do, to do a... PowerPoint. I am, but I need to be able to Alex, are you able to give her screen sharing permission to make to do a PowerPoint on there? Uh, that's not me. That's me, Jennifer. Okay. And then if she could. Oh, she's on there. Over to the end of the table, that'd be great. We can get her audio and camera. I think we just speak first. Should we go down there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. And then, Mr. Chair, I guess when asked why that's happening, could you just announce who the board members are <clears throat> who will be sitting on this application? Sure. Um, I, I'm the chair of the board, Andrew Bombardier. Uh, this is Jason Galvin, and this is Jason Bahanowitz. He, uh, I don't know if it matters, but uh, procedurally, Jason's an alternate uh, sitting in on the on the hearing. Bahanowitz. I don't. Uh, we have, we had a member recuse themselves. I'm not sure of the matter of procedure if we need to declare that, but uh, Linda Leduc uh, recused herself from the hearing. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I don't know if I'm on. You are. Okay. Awesome. So uh, my name is Laura Baker. I work at the Valley Community Development Corporation. I'm the real estate development director there. Uh, joining me tonight is Alexis Breitniker down at the end. She's our executive director. And actually on our Zoom, one of the participants in the Zoom is Felicity Hardy, who's our counsel. Um, so we're here tonight to present an application under, as we've talked about, Chapter 40B, which is an affordable housing statute at the state level. Um, it allows uh, an applicant such as ourselves to ask permission to waive local zoning, any local zoning bylaw or regulation for the purpose of creating affordable housing. Um, and as we'll see in this presentation tonight, we are requesting essentially one waiver, which is permission to create a residential use within an industrial zone. Um, so 40B application, Econology Development, it's at 329 Russell Street. That's right, the one right in front of the Hampshire Mall. Um, and we're here tonight, next slide. Um, this is the location of the hotel. I'm presuming most of you here tonight are very familiar with this location. Um, it's kind of the red balloon there in the middle. What you see behind it is the parking for the mall. Um, right, it's right next to it is there's a Dunkin' Donuts, a nail salon, a Jiffy Lube. It's roughly across uh, Route 9 from the stables. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is what it looks like from the front as you're passing it on Route 9. And also we have a shot of what the building looks like from the rear. Next slide. Um, this is a typical room in the hotel. Um, the rooms are fairly standardized. I don't know how many folks here have stayed at the Econa Lodge, but um, pretty standard double, double occupancy rooms. Uh, each room is equipped with its own bathroom. <laughs> Um, every room has a double window and every room has its own heating and cooling unit. Next. Um, so what we wanted to do is just tell us a little bit about who's involved in this. So the owner of the hotel uh, property currently at 329 is 329 had the LLC. Um, this is a sole purpose LLC, which means limited liability company that's 100% owned by the developer. And so Valley Community Development Corporation is the developer. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, we've been working in the Valley since 1988. Uh, one of our core functions is to develop affordable housing and we own properties in Amherst as well as in Northampton and East Hampton. Uh, we typically need to set up an LLC. It really is for lenders so that we shield the property from any li other liabilities of our corporation. 
Um, we hire a third party property manager called Housing Management Resources. Um, they have a specialty in managing affordable housing. They manage all of our other owned rental properties. Uh, the architect that we're working with is Austin Design Cooperative. They're based in Greenfield and Brattleboro. And I mentioned our attorney, Felicity Hardy, who's from Amherst, who's on our Zoom call with us tonight. Next slide. So this is kind of in a nutshell what we've been talking with the different boards and committees in town about for, I don't know, it feels like about the last nine or 10 months. Um, to basically renovate the existing hotel to create a total of 51 apartments. 50 would be rented to tenants, and one would be for a, a live-in resident manager who would be basically serving as a support person and kind of eyes and ears on the property during the overnight hours. Um, we would combine 24 of the existing rooms. There are 63 double occupancy rooms in the hotel now. So we would combine 24 of those to create 12 one bedroom apartments with kitchens. And we would change 39 existing rooms to studios by adding kitchens to those rooms, which already have a full bath. Um, and then as budget permits, we're hoping to add solar panels on the main hotel and on the storage facility, which is located behind the hotel. Next slide. So a lot of what's there, we're not proposing to change. Um, particularly the site itself. So we are not proposing any changes to the existing site layout, the lighting, the landscaping, the dumpster, the utilities, the parking, the way that cars travel in and out of the property, the signage will either reuse or, or potentially remove. We're not gonna add any additional signage. And in terms of the exterior of the building, what you see as you're going by, it should look the same. The Econo Lodge signs are gone. Um, and we'll do some minor cosmetic repair repairs that are needed on the exterior of the building. Um, but overall, the building and the site are in relatively good uh, condition. Next slide. So uh, this building, some people here probably remember, was newly constructed in 2003. So it's a 20 year old building, um, which for us is wonderful. We often work with antique buildings that don't have modern safety features. So this building has current life safety features. It has sprinklers, it has hardwired smoke detectors and a fire alarm, automated fire alarm system, which is a big plus. Um, the building is also fully handicapped accessible, so you can enter in the wheelchair on grade. Um, there's a working elevator in the building. There are nice wide corridors and doorways. Uh, it has modern uh, HVAC system, which is heating uh, and cooling system including new uh, heat pump mini splits that were installed in 2021. Um, so it is, is a highly functional, relatively uh, modern building. Next slide. So the current density uh, at the property is 63 double occupancy rooms. So 126 person uh, maximum capacity for people staying in the hotel. Um, we are proposing to make it less dense um, and have 51 apartments, which would have a 63 person maximum capacity. If you assume that each of the one bedrooms has two people, a couple, which we don't actually anticipate. So it, it will probably have an occupancy somewhere between 50 people and 63 people. Uh, folks may know that the most recent use of the Econo Lodge was a uh, rental to UMass, which did have double occupancy. Uh, it had 126 students living there. And then as the semester went along, they gradually moved them back onto the campus um, until now, currently the property is vacant. Next. So the goal of this work, this conversion is primarily to provide housing for single adults and some two person households. To have 33 apartments for folks who have very low incomes and 25 of these would have a preference for people who don't have current housing. Uh, 17 apartments for kind of moderate working wage uh, tenants, and then the one resident manager unit, which would have no income cap on it. So I would say that we're really focused on two, two different populations. One is people who need housing who don't have housing, and the other is low wage workers um, or part-time workers um, one of the things that has had, I think, some resonance when we've talked with people in town is the fact that there are so many employment opportunities right around the hotel that will pay kind of entry level service level wages. And that people working in those jobs, chances are, can't afford an apartment in Hadley or Amherst or Northampton. So that was part of our 
motivation. Um, all of these apartments can qualify as affordable housing and listed on the state subsidized housing inventory. Um, that is the document um, that was mentioned earlier where the state's looking for towns to have 10% or more and Hadley is coming in at 12.5%. Um, when we spoke with the planning board early on about this project, one of the things in favor of it was they recognized that some of the properties currently on the state subsidized housing inventory are due to come off. So that affordability can be for a period of time and then properties can come off the subsidized housing inventory. Um, in this case, state funders would require a minimum of 30 years of affordability, which means rents have to be kept low people have to be income eligible for at least 30 years. In many of our properties, we will have longer periods of affordability. Sometimes that is a negotiation with the town. The town might say, we want 50 years or we want even 99 years. Um, if, if we invest and, and give you the permission to have these units, we wanna maintain them for a long, very long period of time. Next. So uh, during the course of kind of thinking about this project and planning it, um, we have, been around town a bit, meeting with different boards and committees. So we met with the Housing and Economic Development Committee, the Planning Board, several times with the Select Board, uh, the Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, and we met with the development team, which is a group uh, that we meets, I think, weekly. The Building Inspector, Fire Chief, Police Chief, DPW Director, the ZBA, and Planning Board Chairs. Um, and it's where you can, it's almost like a tech review meeting. You can go in and propose your project. And, and if any of the department heads have questions or concerns, you can address them before you get to a point like this, where you're actually asking for an application for a permit. Mm -hmm. Next. Again, um, this is the one zoning waiver request that we identified after looking at the bylaw that we would need. Um, we've worked on a number of uh, applications for 40B. Usually there's a long waiver list because we're building something new. Um, in this case, because this is an existing site, there really are not many waivers to be considered. Um, really the only one is to allow multifamily use in a zone where it isn't typically permitted. Next. Uh, this is hard to see. Uh, so if people have questions about the site plan, we'll probably go to another version and try to zoom in on it because it's a little small. Um, but what this is showing you is, is on the left, you see the driveway into the mall, and then you see the property, you see uh, parking lots in front and by the side, you see a large new, uh, this was at the time it was being proposed to be built, structure in the middle, and then behind it, you can see additional uh, potential parking as well as the storage units. So we provided the board with um, what's called an existing utility capacity memorandum uh, from a civil engineer. So they looked at basically, are the utilities on the site adequate for the use that we're proposing? Um, so they looked at sewer, water, electricity, and stormwater. They determined that the change of use would result in reduced daily flow of sewer and reduced use of water which is really based on occupancy because the 126 people is more than the potential 50 to 63 people that we would have in the building. Electricity, uh, expecting to reuse the existing service with the transformer in its current location. And the patterns of stormwater would stay unchanged because we're not proposing any changes to the site plan, to the amount of parking, the area of the parking, area of catch basins, et cetera. Next. So we also had them uh, look a little bit at traffic impacts. Um, one comment they made is that the traffic impacts are quote minimal compared to surrounding uses. This is a this is a heavily trafficked uh, road, as as you know, with a lot of people coming and going from the malls and the different stores. So um, essentially, they assess that the trip generation, which is the number of trips coming and growing going from this particular property, um, would be reduced from its current or previous use as a hotel. Um, so they determine that because there'll be fewer people living there. Um, trip generation counts are typically higher for hotels than for residential. Uh, and many of the tenants that we are proposing to serve will not own a vehicle. They simply won't be able to afford one. And we'll use other modes of transportation like the PBTA bus and the bike trail. So this hotel um, has bus access uh, pretty much directly in front of the hotel. And then if you cross Route 9 on the other side, there's also a bus shelter there. Um, and then the rail trail picks up right behind the mall. 
Um, the site has 70 paved parking spaces now, which e equals 1.4 spaces per unit. There's also an area for 57 unpaved parking spaces that are down kind of near where the storage areas are for a total potential capacity of 2.3 spaces per unit. Uh, what we find in our other rental housing is that we run about 0.3 to 0.6 um, spaces per unit in terms of demand from our tenants. So it it's clear to us that there's ample parking for the tenants and staff and visitors who might come to visit people who are living there. Um, so this is a quick look at, you know, these are two different configurations. One is kind of a standard room and one is a handicapped accessible room. Um, currently the hotel has a number of accessible rooms. We would plan to have four fully handicapped accessible rooms for, for tenants, two studios and two one bedrooms. Um, and you can see on the left is the typical unit. Essentially we're adding a, a, a run of kitchen. It will be a fully functional kitchen, a range, you know, stovetop, oven, sink, refrigerator, and then the bathroom is existing. Next. Uh, typical one bedroom, uh, essentially kind of creating a path passageway between two rooms so that one room can serve as a kitchen kind of living area and the other room connected to the bathroom can serve as a bedroom. Um, the studios were around 257 square feet and the one bedrooms are around 514 square feet. So they're modest. These are modest apartments. Um, we uh, expect to provide indoor common areas. So currently the hotel is a pool. Um, we would eliminate the pool and use that kind of large space as a community room. Uh, we would have several offices there. We would have some flex spaces for classrooms or computer rooms and a shared laundry room. Next. Um, and so staffing, one of the questions we get a lot um, at a zoning hearing like this is, you know, supervision and staffing on site um, given the tenant population. And so what we're looking at for this property is again, to have a live-in person who's there overnights, uh, to have a full-time uh, daytime resident services coordinator. This person is not a clinician necessarily, but they're, they're kind of whatever you need staffer, uh, probably with a social work background who will help connect tenants with whatever services they might need, whether they're vocational, transportation, you know, whatever it is that they need to connect with in our region, which is pretty rich in uh, human service providers. Um, we'd expect to have a full-time property manager and part-time maintenance staff on site. And there is an on-call overnight crisis service provider that serves the region, not just this property. Next. Just a, again, a recap of our property management company. They're called H Housing Management Resources. They manage over 8,000 apartments. Um, they do a lot of affordable housing management and we know them well because they manage all of our other current rental properties. Um, next. So another question that comes up pretty frequently um, at zoning hearings is how will we as the you know, owners of this property make sure that it's in good condition and that it doesn't get run down or in disrepair over years, over the years. So the management company, because they'll have staff on site, um, they will be doing cleaning, they'll be doing routine repairs, and they'll contract out for services like trash plowing, landscaping. Um, we will um, seed a capital replacement fund. So when we do the renovation work, we'll put money aside into a capital replacement fund. And then every year we'll add to it so that the roof is actually new, but when it needs to be replaced in 20 or 30 years, we'll have accrued enough funds to do that. Um, and this protects against having a property that becomes run down over time. Next. Um, so our timeline uh, was to acquire the property, which, which happened in January, to come here, uh, do this zoning review and permitting process uh, in February and March, um, if we are approved, to move forward in April and May to advance plans and to fine tune our budgets and in June apply for state financing, which is where the majority of the money would come from, uh, both for the acquisition of the property as well as the renovations. Um, potentially close on this financing in November and undertake re rent renovations in late fall to spring of 2023 to 2024, lease up in 2024. And this is really kind of a best case timeline if everything clicks into place. 
Um, obviously, we'll see what happens tonight. We'll hear what kind of questions or comments people have. Next. That's it. So we are very um, interested in hearing people's comments and questions. Sure. Yeah, uh, we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do the board first. Then we're gonna do any any other board members, and then then we'll do uh, public questions. Um, so uh, I had a, I had a couple questions. Um, I guess also as, as a I don't know. I guess we'll start with I've received some documentation from people um, that was sent directly to me. I, there was a there was a um, a petition that uh, I'll read that is uh, was signed by forty five people, forty five or so people in town. Um, that's a petition against the, uh, the redevelopment of the property. Um, the petition says uh, a well-funded real estate developer of Valley CDC wants to purchase a Route 9 Hadley Hotel, convert it to permanent housing for homeless and lower no-income individuals, has plans for additional projects, forever altering the business corridor that has supported the town's tax base and protected our residential neighborhoods for decades. And this change would require special zoning board approval and a deed restriction opening the door to other apartment developers Converting businesses to nonprofit developments will destroy the town's tax base. Hadley already does more than its fair share to support affordable housing efforts. In fact, Hadley is well over its required percentage per state guidelines. As a town, we have gone above and beyond to support low-income individuals. Uh, we'll continue to do so, but destroying our tax base would have long-term consequences on our public safety, schools, and other local services. Um, and that a major shift in our business and cultural outlook should be decided through a deliberative process in town meeting, uh, not by a few members of an appointed board. Uh, the zoning board and any other board this comes before should reject uh, this development. Um, we also received um, a letter from the finance committee. I don't know, does anyone from the finance committee want to speak to the letter that, that you guys submitted? You want me to read it off? Or? Sure. The microphone's up here, David. So I just wrote this up based on our February 16th, 2023 Finance Committee meeting. Uh, it says at the February 16th, 2023 Finance Committee meeting, the members unanimously agreed to send this letter to the Zoning Board of Appeals regarding some areas of concern and unanswered questions, which may have financial ramifications for the town of Padley due to the proposed Econo Lodge location zoning change request. One is potential lost revenue because of the proposed use versus the current hotel business. Two, the need to study the financial impact of potential added costs to the town versus current or other possible uses for the property. Three, does the proposed use serve the highest priority group of residents currently residing in town, such as seniors, which are approximately 19.5% of our population versus the 6.3% that are under the poverty level? Or would a, any potential added cost be as a result of bringing non-residents into town? Police, fire, and ambulance financial impacts because of increased manpower needs, increased equipment needs, et cetera. Uh, we have been repeatedly told by our chiefs that manpower as it stands now is just barely meeting demands. <clears throat> what would be the additional cost to these departments submitted, uh, respectfully submitted on behalf of the finance committee members? Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's an... Um, we will speak to the uh, um, the public records one later. Um, there's a public records request that uh, a group of people put together also with uh, about police calls to to the hotels in town. But we can we we'll discuss to discuss that as part of the um, uh, other board input. Um, some of my questions, uh, some of the questions I just had while listening to the um, to the presentation. Um, the, with the people are the people going to sign uh, like official leases as part of the program? Is it is this an overall program? Are these people enrolled like in a program with Valley Development Corporation? No. So this is this is primarily housing um, for folks that may need some extra services to su be successful in that housing. Um, so yes, everybody who comes in um, 
goes through a screening process. We do a quarry check. We do landlord references. We do credit references, just like you would with any apartment. Um, and so if you're approved for an apartment, you would sign a one-year lease. You would get to renew that lease year after year, as long as you are not in violation of the lease. Um, if you are in violation of the lease or don't pay your rent, you can be evicted just like any other type of um, housing, apartment housing. And what are your thresholds for those applications? Like if you don't pass your quarry or if that's you know. So it depends. We we have some discretion in evaluating quarries. Um, there are certain things that the federal government says if someone if this pops up on someone's quarry, you can't have them. Arson is one. Production of methylphenidates is another. Um, any kind of violent activity harm towards others is something that would raise a red flag to us. Um, but if you had a like a non-payment of child support or something like that, we wouldn't, you know, we would look at your current situation. Okay. Um, so there is some discretion in looking at the quarries. Okay, because this building is next to a, a school. So there'd be no kind of anybody that wouldn't pass the quarry for say not being allowed within a hundred feet of a school or something like that wouldn't be allowed to house there. Yeah. I don't know if we're within a hundred feet of it, but um, yes. So we're looking for folks that are going to be good neighbors uh, for everybody, as well as the other people in the building. Mm -hmm. I, I would just comment that we've owned a, a property that houses similar folks, homeless and very, very low income folks in Northampton. We owned it for about 30 years. It abuts the bridge street elementary school. Um, and it has for 30 years. And we did an expansion, a pretty major expansion on that building a few years ago. We went to talk with the school principal and she didn't know where we were. She didn't know which building it was. Mm -hmm. So it really had never, and this was like their fence, the kids were throwing balls over. It was right against the elementary school. So we do not see our tenants as posing any kind of risk for school children whatsoever. The services uh, are the serv uh, so again so this is just primarily housing so the services are are voluntary services they're not correct they are voluntary services. Is this through DHCD? Yes. yes. And DHCD will be providing financing as well. Yes. To the tune of how much? About twelve million dollars. And that's for running maintenance staffing. So essentially, we look at two kinds of budgets. The, the, what we're doing now is, you know, we'd be applying for the money for the development, which includes acquisition financing, the renovations that are needed, the legal work that's needed to kind of get the property up and running. And then we have an operating budget that's based primarily on the rents. So in this case, we'll have below market rents for people who are in that kind of middle working class range. Um, and we anticipate having rental subsidies for folks who are very low income. So if you make $10,000 a year, you can't afford market rate rent or even below market rate rent. You'd pay a third of your income toward the rent and the subsidy would pay the rest. And like all of our properties, pretty much there, the attempt is to be self-supporting with them um, so that the rental income comes in and supports the cost of operating the project. What are the rental ranges for the say the studio to the one bedroom? Yeah, I think I have those here. Department of Housing and Community Development, I believe. Yes. That is what it is. Oh, I'm writing on it. So uh, the 60% rents, which are these kind of middle tier rents, uh, right now, and they change every year, they get updated, uh, $988 for an efficiency, including all utilities, $1,059 for one bedroom, including all utilities. Um, and again, if you have, if you're low enough income and have a, a unit with a subsidy attached to it, then you would, your rent would float based on your income. If your income went up, you'd pay more rent. If your income went down, you'd pay less rent. And utilities is heat, electricity, cable, internet. Yeah, in this case, we would include all utilities uh, in the rent. Uh, so that is heat, air conditioning, plug-in electric. The building has Wi-Fi. Really everything but um, like cable television and, and phone. Okay. But each unit is individually wired for those cable and phone access independently of each other? Yeah, they were at a hotel. Oh. So yeah, they are wired. Could, uh, could there be children living in the building? Um, it's possible. We don't think it's likely. I mean, we can't discriminate against people based on their household composition or size. Um, but it's not 
it's not the population we anticipate is mostly going to live in the property. We think it's going to be single adults, especially in the efficiencies are really sized for one person. Um, we wanted to have one bedroom so that we could accommodate couples as well. And these residents have to have employment or actively seeking employment. So if you're in, if you have to come up with $988 or $1,059 a month, you have to have a source of income. So you could be a veteran and you could have veterans benefits. You could be retired and have a pension, or you could be working and have employment income. Uh, we serve all those folks. We serve rich veterans. We serve a lot of retirees who can't afford market rate housing, um, as well as folks on disability, as well as a lot of people just working minimum wage jobs who cannot live in our region because rents are so expensive. So whether it be from work or what have you, um, yep. there is in income. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. What, um, with, with uh, 25 of the units being set aside for current, I don't know, currently homeless people or previous, like recently homeless people, like saying that you need to have a job and everyone's going to be paying somebody to stay there. Like how, how does that process work? So I think I, I just want to take one second to say that a lot of people fall into the category of, of being unhoused or homeless, and it might be different than what your associations are. So it could be someone who's living in a situation of domestic violence is homeless, someone who's living in a place that's closing or unsafe. So which was it? That, was it the Amherst? There was an Amherst hotel just down the road that closed and they built Aspen Heights. That was an example of people, everybody who lived there was considered homeless because their housing was being removed through no fault of their own. Um, folks going through divorce often pass through our doors. Um, and you could have someone who's who has SSI because they have a disability, who doesn't. Again, there are a lot of people working. What's surprising from the shelter providers is how many people in shelter go to work during the day and then go to the shelter at night. It is common that people go to work during the day and go to a shelter at night because their job doesn't pay them enough to have an apartment. And these are the very kinds of jobs, I think, that there are so many of right along this Route 9 corridor. Um, do you have any plans of outreach to those potential employers? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you tell me a little more about that? So we're, we're, we're a ways away from doing that. Right. So it's not a formal plan, but we would be reaching out to any kind of business associations in the area. We would be reaching out to all the business owners who operate in proximity in both of the malls and the other stores along the Route 9 strip. Um, we would flyer those stores. We would ask if they have employee newsletters that we could post our um, listings in. That is a main part of why this location made sense to us um, because there's so many people working right there's such a concentration of low-wage workers right in this area who are commuting from other places who would love to live in Hadley but they can't find anything they can afford are there um are there least restrictions on like the number of people that that they would be in the unit like you please yes. like the efficiencies are meant for one person like the yes. says you can't have someone else stay with you yes. So yeah, absolutely. Just like any apartment would have lease restrictions. If you, if you have an apartment that's large enough for another person, you'd still have to have that person would have to be screened and accepted by the landlord to move in. Um, in some places we have restrictions on overnight guests. Um, in other places we don't. Um, but you can't have someone move in. Usually there is some kind of whether it's two weeks or three days, we have different different patterns in different places, but there's some restriction on how long you can have a house guest stay overnight. Is there any uh, comparable metrics on like the crisis providers? Like you mentioned the on-call piece of it. Um, so they're not on-site for that. It's a, it's an on-call kind of a service that somebody, right. somebody has to call to. Yeah. Is it going to be the one person on-site that's managing the property or is it going to be the individuals? There's a problem <laughs> So for me, I'm just trying to understand, yeah. you know, issues resolution. Right. I know. SLA kind I know. Of you know, it's interesting when we, we have a property under construction in Amherst, folks might've read about it in the paper. It's at 132 Northampton road. Um, as a consequence of the permitting for that project, also in a safe Harbor community, um, we did a lot of looks at police logs, um, both for existing properties, for comparable properties, um, we looked at the Amherst College, um, at the college call logs for campus police. 
Um, and we found that the call rates out of our properties were higher, but not dramatically higher. Um, we also don't have on-site staff. We have smaller buildings, and so we don't have the revenue to have on-site staff. Our um, understanding from other providers who have on-site staff is you're able to catch many of the 911 calls before they go out the door. So when we look at police logs from other similar rental properties, a lot of the calls are not true emergencies. I mean, that's true of 911 in general, but we have people call if they can't find something or someone's making noise in the building. And the purpose of having on-site staff is all of those kinds of issues that are truly not emergencies would get handled in-house. Um, there will still be 911 calls, um, just like there were when it was rented to the UMass or when it was a hotel. And that site resident person will be trained in that kind of interaction mm -hmm. with residents? Mm -hmm. And is, is one person enough for the quantity of people that might be in yeah. there? And I guess really right from a, yeah. um, a percentage standpoint, yeah. it seems- It's a great question, honestly. It's yeah. one we grapple with all the time. Um, I think between having a full-time property manager on site plus a full-time resident services coordinator, we'll be able to handle most things that come up. I mean, you end up having, just like life, society in general, you may have a few people who have a lot of issues and then almost everybody else has no issues and doesn't demand any of that person's time. So, With these services being voluntary, so these are, are these some of like ancillary services? These aren't like services. Are the people that, are you seeking out people that need services or are these services that are just like available for people that happen to be living there? I don't know if that would be. Does that make sense? Like, we are, we are is that like a is that like a criteria to get in that you need services or are they it is not available to it's you? not a criteria to get in, but we know the nature of the populations that we're targeting. People will have needs. It, mm -hmm. th there's a reason people haven't been able to maintain housing in the past, and so instead of just putting a roof over someone's head and saying, "Here you go, now now it's all good," right? Here's the key. <laughs> Uh, we don't we don't think that that's enough. We think that people need extra help um, to maintain their tenancies. <clears throat> but in terms of um, somebody being removed from the building, it's going to kind of just follow general landlord tenant law. It's not a absolutely. It's not like a. It's not like you said. It's right. not a program where you're right. going to be kicking people out of right. the program. Exactly. We can't make people go to therapy or do counseling or anything like that. What we would deal with just as any landlord would, our behaviors, usually what happens in our building is, is if there's a behavior, it's disruptive to other people living in the building. It's not a community problem, but someone's making noise at 2 a.m. So that would be a lease violation. You get some warnings, you get people working with you. Ultimately, if you can't resolve that lease violation situation, you would you would be evicted. Who does the vetting of these people? Yeah. So um, it... Yeah. So it goes through our property management company, Housing Management Resources. They're really seasoned at this. Um, so there, it starts with an application. Um, it includes references, whether it's landlord references, provider references. Um, it includes a Corey check that I mentioned, includes an interview uh, with the staff. So it's a little more rigorous than probably a market rate landlord would do. Um, and then, you know, often people have referrals maybe from someone else who's known to the property manager. So we can, we can get some background that way as well. You guys have any other, you wanna, um, I, I have a letter from the, uh, from the Committee on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion uh, that, that I, I thought I had printed out, but I just found on my phone. I don't know if there's anyone on the call uh, from the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee or anyone here who wants to speak to that letter. You want me to read it or would you? Okay. Uh, so the letter uh, is, dear members of the Hadley Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Chair Andrew Bombardier, Linda LaDuke, Jason Galvin, Jason Bahanaways, and John Kukowski. As the Hadley Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, CDEI, we are writing to offer our perspective on the conversion of the Econo Lodge at 329 Russell Street to affordable housing. 
<clears throat> we offer our reflections within the context of the select board's charge to the CDEI in August 2020 to advise, promote, and foster the development of policies, programs, activities directed towards anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our perspective is informed by presentations and discussions in which we engaged over the last two years, um, a joint meeting with the Housing and Economic Development Committee and presentation by Bill Dwyer on zoning in Hadley on 9 August 2021, two presentations by Valley CDC Administrators Laura Baker and Alexis uh, Breitnecker, Breitnecker, 25 October 2022 and 8 December 2022. These uh, CDEI meeting discussions on 17, uh, sorry, three CDEI meeting discussions on 17 November 2022, 19 January 2023, and 16 February 2023. In addition, several of our members participated in Hadley Learns program on housing on 1 April 2021, 6 May 2021, 17 October 2022, 3 November 2022. Also members attended an Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Zoom meeting in September 2022, and others reviewed articles on affordable housing and on local preference. In affordable housing, we support strongly support the renovation of the Econo Lodge into 51 affordable housing units for five reasons. One, stable affordable housing is fundamental to the health of the individual and the community, including the economic health of the town. We anticipate no great difference to the tax base with this conversion from business to residential as Valley CDC will pay taxes on it. According to Hadley's master, uh, two, according to Hadley's master plan 2017 update, Household size is decreasing while much of our existing stock is for larger households. This project uh, addresses the most needed type of affordable housing designed for low income, smaller one to two person households. Number three, this project provides needed housing right on the public bus route and within walking distance of jobs and services. Uh, number four, it also addresses the town's goal of providing housing while preserving open space and farmland. Number, uh, number five, this project is in partnership with Valley CDC. We are confident in their ability to provide the administrative leadership, facility management, and resident services that will result in a safe, comfortable, and successful residential community. On the local preference, as the town considers the opportunity to request lottery prioritization for individuals with Hadley ties, residency, employment, and or children in school, we expressed our concern about pursuing the local preference option. We offer the following reflections. <clears throat> Uh, we offer the following reflections and recommendations for your consideration. We suggest the luck of the draw be given equal consideration. The luck of the draw is a widely accepted standard of fairness, specifically an open lottery without local preference, offers fairness in that it provides an equal opportunity for all. We understand that a, ha that a number of Hadley residents may want local preference as it provides an opportunity to take care of individuals who have already made a commitment to the town through residency, employment, and or children in school. Offering even a small percentage of local preference may address this interest and increase public support. We want to emphasize that by giving preference to some, we would be limiting the opportunity for others and therefore perpetuating a system of inequity. Housing like employment is a regional issue and not just a town by town concern. Not requesting local preference or requesting a small percentage makes Hadley a better neighbor to other towns. Further, a high local, pre local preference in a predominantly white town like Hadley reduces the racial diversity in the lottery pool, this not only diminishes the opportunity to increase racial diversity in Hadley, but inadvertently perpetuates a racist housing system. Recent research on issues related to housing and equity has found that maintaining high local preference thresholds in housing developments contributes to greater access to housing for white tenants over tenants of color, potentially furthering racial inequality and housing discrimination. Predominantly white cities and towns across the Commonwealth have examined this issue and have determined that foregoing the adoption of a local preference for a proposed affordable housing is one anti-racist action with immediate reach. We concur with this perspective and see this local preference decision as a concrete opportunity for Hadley to act on community values of openness, inclusion, and justice in regards to who has access to housing. Consistent with our charge from the select board in 2020 to advise, promote, and further the development of policies directed towards anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we recommend that the town of Hadley offer everyone who qualifies an equal opportunity. We urge the Zoning Board of Appeals to select a zero to 30% local preference for the proposed housing project. Conclusion, the CDEI supports all programs and activities that can help increase the diversity of Hadley. Although this low-income housing project is one action that can help bring more diversity to our predominantly white town, we believe this is one action amongst many that would need to happen. There is more to be done. 
We need to create more places for people of color of all economic and social statuses, along with events where we can mix, mingle, and get to know each other in such an enjoyable way that this attracts others to Hadley. <clears throat> Not just because the pro property taxes are low, but because we are a diversity welcoming community. Thank you very much for considering our input and for supporting affordable housing in Hadley. Respectfully, Mark Dunn Chair, Wayne Abercrombie, Joanne Goding, Megan Raylan, Pat Rismeyer, and Sarah Strong, the Hadley Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. If there's no other questions from our board right now, I will open up to if, if there's any other board, tiers, board members here that would like to speak to anything. I know I see Randy here from the select board, uh, um, or if there's anyone online uh, that would like to like to speak from planning board or any other town boards. If you're online, uh, have a meeting in second. Public comment? Bill Dwyer just came in. Uh, yeah. Can she come to either one of these microphones? Yeah, you can go that one. Yeah. Just have you state your name and, and the board you're on. So, Amy Fiden, and I'm the chair on the Finance Committee, and um, I'm also on the Economic Development um, Committee. Uh, and I was a board member for almost 10 years on Valley CDC. Um, Valley CDC is an amazing um, organization, they're fabulous. Um, my biggest thing is I am, um, being the chair of the finance committee, it is so important to look at town finances. Unfortunately, I don't see that this is, in my opinion, that this is, um, I guess, a good deal for the town. I don't see where the benefit is for the town's finances. I only see, um, as it is, we'll be losing a, about $110,000 a year in rooms tax. I don't see where... Um, this is a benefit financially for the town. All I see right now is a strain on more of our services. So Route 9 brings a lot of um, income to us. Um, so it keeps our taxes very, very low. And um, changing into apartments, I don't necessarily think that is the right thing to do, especially at this meeting. I think that is something that the town needs to look at if you want to look at changing our bylaws. Um, but um, I think that Route 9 um, gives us a lot of income and helps keep our taxes low. So in my opinion, I think that this is not the right move for Hadley. Um, I, do I do support the ideas. I do like what they have to say. I originally supported the idea um, when I was on the economic um, the housing um, committee, they said that they had support. I did vote yes in the very beginning. I have changed my mind since. Um, I thought we were in bigger jeopardy of losing our 10%. I really did. And then I learned a lot more about it. And there is no immediate need um, for um, our 10%. Um, so I feel that um, we should not do this project. Thanks. Do I have your hand up? Yeah. Bill? Hi. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I have apparently a, uh, an intermittent connection here, so I hope this gets through. Uh, the planning board will have an agenda item at our next meeting, which will be uh, March 7th, uh, on whether we want to uh, take a position on this. I just wanted to go on the record to let you know that. <clears throat> When was that meeting, Bill? March 7th? <clears throat> Molly? Uh, so I'm just going to speak um, as a representative from the Hadley Housing and Economic Development Committee. Um, I know Randy's there, so I'm, I'm assuming Randy's going to speak for the select board, but if not, um, I could certainly do that. Um, you know, as Amy pointed out, we did have unanimous support on the Housing and Economic Development Committee. Um, our charge is, a, is an advisory committee to the select board and um, in many ways the planning board is to promote these types of conversations. Um, we don't have a town planner. So uh, to the extent we can further conversations around the issues of housing, as well as um, development along, in particular along the Route 9 corridor, that's what our committee's charged with. 
So um, we met with the folks from Valley CDC uh, multiple times. Many of the questions that were actually posed tonight um, by the finance committee, I think were asked and answered um, satisfactorily. And I, you know, I think the general conversation that we had where um, I would disagree slightly with what Amy said in terms of a sense of urgency is that these types of projects don't happen overnight. And it's been um, really kind of hammered into us that it's much easier to either try to retain existing stock or do kind of a, a multi-unit project like this suggests. So given the fact that it's an existing hotel, um, we've already lost that hotel revenue. So it's not that we're going to lose the, the room revenue by going to this project, that revenue has already stopped to the town. Um, the seller you know, made it clear that he, did, he no longer wanted it to be a hotel, nor does he want anyone else to run it as a hotel. So I just wanted to make, make that clear. Um, and, you know, there is housing stock, and I think probably the planning board will be talking about that uh, when they meet, but there is housing stock that is coming off now, um, basically in the month of March, which is the Mountain View. Um, we would still be over the threshold, even if we lose those units. But then the next big, uh, it's uh, Vesta, I believe it's, well, we still call it Winfield, but um, I believe it's called Vesta now. That inventory is actually um, in part uh, potentially coming off. And even though that's not for several years away, um, it would indeed put us at risk for an unfriendly 40B at that point in time. And I know, you know, five or six years down the road may seem far, far away, but in the absence of something like this, um, that could plug uh, and put us in, in much better solid footing. I think it would give, it would buy the town time and ultimately in the long run, uh, cost the town less. So uh, given the location, given the ease of the transition, um, that's why our committee supported it. And again, you know, we did have conversations with police, fire and the like, and we were satisfied that this would not pose an undue burden to the town um, from a financial standpoint. Thank you. Dr. Z. Dr. Z. Uh, if you come up here, yeah, just people online can hear you. First of all, this is a basic question. Is this a friendly 40B? Mm -hmm. A friendly 40B means we still have the option without the club over our head, like if we did not have 10% of our zoning as affordable. As you mentioned, uh, 12 point, uh, 12 and a half percent now. But this is the highest in the valley, actually, when we would consider many towns, even our neighboring Northampton and Amherst, just barely creep over 10 percent. Sunderland had one percent, but they're putting up some new apartments. South Hadley has four percent, Hatfield has two percent. We have done our share. And number two, uh, the fact that some of these are affordable units are supposedly coming off the affordable limits. There is a court case pending uh, in Eastern Mass. I want to say uh, Situate or Cohasset, one of those towns, that if the underlying zoning does not permit apartments, they are not allowed to go market rate, for example. Uh, if this were allowed, then all of a sudden, if 30 years expired, uh, it would have to be a zone change that allowed multi-unit apartments. So this is kind of a straw man that people keep throwing up. Well, we're going to come off these numbers pretty soon. Uh, that court case is going to be a significant impact on many, many towns. So that's something to be aware of. Sunderland has a friendly 40B. They did a town survey. The town survey said primarily people 16 and older should be the ones that are really needy now. For example, they probably can't work. And with inflation, many people are, have to work a little harder trying to make 
their ends meet. So they had a age limit, 60 and over. They also had it in perpetuity, not 30 years, but forever. So if we ever have our, our, our backs to the wall, then we can put out requests for proposals. Who's going to make the best proposal to the town that will make the most economic sense? Right now, we're only presented with one. So if people are so inclined to have more affordable housing, the select board can put out a request for proposal. And Settlement has a, a great one. It, uh, and it, it does spell out every step of the way. And I don't think there's any significant negative impact for the town of Settlement. Um, what are the other points? Uh, yeah, only 30 years, uh, that's, that should be a perpetuity. And coming off the rolls, and some people say, well, how did this ever become industrial? And I'll, I'll give a little bit of a history. When the mall, Mountain Farms Mall, became known as the Dead Mall, uh, there was concerns that we were going to not have a significant economic input like we all anticipated. So there are several incubator companies come, came before the planning board and they wanted to rezone to industrial. I'll give an example of one. Uh, uh, Trent Cole is an engineer, graduated from University of Massachusetts, is, is doing, was doing research on microparticles and how you measure them. And he was going to construct industrial uh, units to measure this. So, but it wasn't his own for industry. So I said, hey, this would be a good idea. And the planning board came up with the industrial zone for that particular area. So it was not spot zoning, but the whole area was uh, industrial zone. We were hoping to get more incubator industries coming in. Well, they were incubated quite well and they moved out be quite successful. So that's how this became an industrial zone as opposed to a business zone like most of Route 9. Uh, if there are any other zoning questions, like Bill said, the uh, the planning board will make a their recommendation. But uh, right now, I think if if those people who are interested in something like this, we should get a group together to put out a request for proposal, and it should become go before the town meeting, not put the burden on three people on the zoning board of appeals, and. Uh, Sunland did exactly that. So uh, there are options available to us. Thank you. Thank you. I guess public I guess Bobby kind of forced me to speak. Now I have to speak. So based on what Molly Keegan said, the, the, the select board, they, the opinion of the select board is that we're concerned about the affordable housing number in town. And we're at 12 and a half percent, yes. But in my opinion, the town itself did very little to get there. We got it stuffed down our throat through an unfriendly 40B. And we're trying to avoid that in the future. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, five years down the road. But my personal opinion is we've got a property on Route 9 that can be rehabilitated for this purpose. And it will save us potentially down the road from an unfriendly 40B, which is not limited to Route 9. An unfriendly 40B can happen any place in town. And so we, we're just concerned about that aspect and that's why the select board is in favor of it. Thank you. So the select board provided a letter of support as well. I don't know if we wanna read it into record. Okay. I can I'll read this like word. Do you mind? 
this is the uh, as, as part of the 40B process, what actually brings the the uh, among the other requirements, some of the requirements, uh, what kicks off this process and brings it to the ZBA is the, the select board has to issue a, a letter of interest to the applicant. So this is the letter of interest that the select board issued on August 23rd, 2022. Um, the project eligibility letter application for 329 Russell Street. Uh, dear Ms. Racer and Ms. Crowley walked out. On behalf of the Town of Hadley Select Board, I am pleased to submit this letter of support for the project eligibility letter application from Valley Community Development for redevelopment of the Econo Lodge at 329 Russell Street in Hadley. Valley proposes to convert the existing hotel into 50 affordable apartments with supportive services. Hadley currently has 12.59% of its housing stock classified as affordable on the DHCD subsidized housing inventory and developing a variety of housing options as a long-term goal recognized in the most recent master plan update. The Econo Lodge sits in the heart of the commercial slash industrial zone in Hadley, surrounded by dozens of retail establishments, employing hundreds of entry level workers. The proposed apartments will be affordable to workers who are essential to Hadley's employees, employers, and within walking distance to many of these businesses. The site is transit friendly and a great location for tenants who may not own a car. It is located on the most frequently traveled bus route in our region and adjacent to a well used rail trail. As an operational hotel, it has adequate parking and infrastructure already in place. In addition to discussions with the Select Board, Valley staff met with Hadley's Economic, Hadley's Housing and Economic Development Committee. This committee voted in support of the project. Hadley has additional committees working to increase housing opportunity and advance equity, such as the Housing Production Plan and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Consistent with the master plan update, Hadley is requesting a preference for local residents when these apartments become available. Thank you in advance for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Jane Nevis. With select board chair. CD Debrinzi and I'm with the building department. Um, we have spoken with Laura before on uh, our project coordinating meeting. Um, I guess mostly our concern is is that um, as far as our jobs are life safety, and we deal with the police and fire also. And because of our staffing right now, our concern is having um going from a, a hotel to apartments having the kitchens things like that um we have a lot of calls many days from vesta especially because the smoke detectors going off things like that where it's using up our safety resources and so that is one of our big concerns right now is um not having enough staff um to you know, take on something else like this at the moment. Um, I think that's why it, it is something that would really need to be worked on as far as especially staffing, because it is an ongoing thing. We you know deal with these things a lot with apartment complexes. So that is one of our big concerns. Thank you. Open for now or um just that um, in regard to what Dee was just speaking to David, do you want to do you want to address that with your information there? Public reference. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, if if there is there anyone else uh, on, a, on a board or committee in town that would like to speak? Okay. So hearing hearing uh, hearing no one else, we'll have we'll get we'll get, we'll get to we'll you, Kevin. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so one of the biggest concerns I've heard is police, fire, and ambulance resource strains. So what I did is a public records request for five different lo uh, hotel locations from the Hadley Police Department from January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2022. And basically I got all the police, fire, and ambulance calls for those locations. I went through and I crossed out, you know, traffic stops, disabled vehicles, motor vehicle accidents, impounds erratic driving roadway hazards things like that because for example if there's an accident in front of howard johnson's on route 9 it's logged in the police call log as happening on howard johnson's so it's impossible to differentiate whether it actually happened at the hotel or in the roadway in front uh, same with neighborhood checks property checks business checks park and walkthroughs those are similar where you know an officer may park his car in the parking lot walk through a hotel it could be because there's a problem there. It could be because he just decided that's a good place to patrol. It could be requested at the request of the business owner. 
So those are some of the ones that I eliminated just because it's hard to say whether it's because of a problem or it's preventative. Um, I've got the number of rooms for each of these hotels from records at Town Hall, and then also called the front desks where, where available. Obviously, Econo Lodge is closed, so couldn't talk to anybody at the front desk there, but got the, uh, the number of rooms at the time from Town Hall Records. So the hotels that I looked at was Hampton Inn, 24 Bay Road. During this time, there were 72 calls. There are 72 rooms at the hotel that are in use. Uh, that equals one call per room on average. Uh, there has been no known use of this hotel during the time period for homeless, low income or temporary COVID shelters. Next was Knights Inn, 208 Russell Street. There were 99 calls at that hotel. There are 18 rooms in that hotel, which is 5.5 calls per room. Uh, this and Howard Johnson's, which I'll get to, are probably the closest where there were long-term homeless or low-income individuals living in these locations. Um, for Nights In, Craig's Doors Homeless Program was there. And uh, based on calling the front desk, they really don't rent retail rooms to customers off the street. It's all subsidized. It's all homeless. It's all long-term people living there, basically. Um, next one was the Econo Lodge, 329 Russell Street. During this time period, there were 79 calls. 63 rooms is what they had available, uh, according to town records. 1.254 calls per room. Uh, it was used for homeless and low income. They did use it for a COVID positive first responder temporary lodging early in the COVID pandemic. Um, and obviously there's no further data now because the hotel's not actually operating. Um, next is the Comfort Inn, which was formerly the Holiday Inn, 400 Russell Street. There were 63 calls in 100 rooms, 0 0.630 calls per room. No known use for homeless, low income or temporary COVID shelters, based on calling the front desk, most of their uh, customers are off the street uh, retail rates, such as business travelers, vacationers, people seeing UMass, things like that. The last one is Howard Johnson's, 401 Russell Street. 190 calls, there's 104 rooms there, 1.827 calls per room. Uh, most of this hotel is homeless and low income extended stay. Most of their rooms are rented uh, on a weekly or monthly basis, generally to very low income individuals. Based on calling the front desk, very few customers are retail customers, like I mentioned, uh, business travelers, vacationers, things along those lines. Um, also, according to the front desk person I spoke with, generally there's not 100 rooms available. Even though they have 100 rooms, they rent typically about half of that. So, I didn't take that into account because it's hard to say how many rooms were available on a particular night. So I just wanted to compare um, the number of police calls, for example, compared to Hampton Inn, compared to Knights Inn. You're talking about a 400% increase in police, re in police fire and ambulance resources. If you compare Knights Inn to, it would be Comfort Inn, you're talking about a 693% increase in police fire and medical calls and what's associated with that. Speaking to Chief Mason, he said, Knights Inn and Howard Johnson's, the severity of the crimes are much worse. Assault and battery, Knights Inn has had several, several instances where tasers have been deployed, fights, et cetera. And all of these calls are listed in public records. Anybody can get a hold of them and everything's listed. Um, you know, anything from suspicious activity, you know, noise complaints, assault and battery, domestic violence, on and on. So the idea that there's no increase in 911 calls based on a standard hotel is, is just false. So I just wanted to put that information out there. Thank you. Mr. Kevitz. So the people so people online can hear you, they all have to I listened with great interest to what Dr. Zagradic had to say about the 40B and the triggers and the right to reject. I also heard about the, the different levels or percentages in our neighboring communities that doesn't this doesn't get hardly off the hook we're at 12 and a half what it does it frees up northampton and amherst that's what i think it is and i hope 
you listen to what everybody has to say, the tough job that you have. But you have the uh, safe harbor, the right to reject. I would hope you consider that. Thank you. Randy, did you want to say something? I, want, I want to ask Mr. Phil a question regarding whether he knows about the people that are staying at the Knights Inn, whether they are wholly subsidized or are they actually participating in paying their rent? So I think that would make a difference. So I asked that question, they refused to provide an answer. They said they don't give income or customer information. So I asked that for all the locations, what they were. Laura, do you, I, do you, I mean, really that program, do you know how that Yeah, program, so well, two about? comments. One is that part of the reason the Econo Lodge came to our attention was that it was rented by Craig Stores um, during the pandemic. Um, they rented the whole first floor. And when we spoke around town to the different officials, it didn't raise any red flags that we heard from them about it being a problem. Um, and that kind of caught our attention. Um, the Knights Inn uh, briefly served, I don't know for how many months it served as a homeless shelter. Um, we don't have a lot of information about that. One thing I would just say is that a homeless shelter is different than permanent housing. And so I'm not trying to whitewash it, but it is a different level of staffing it is a different level of permanence of population than you might have at a shelter um, we also did a similar pu public record search uh, as i mentioned when we were um, proposing something in amherst and i think we mm -hmm. came in around two calls per person per year mm -hmm. um, so again kind of somewhere in the area of what you were saying about which was it the the Howard Johnson. So seeing seeing a bump from a typical population, but we did not see anything consistent with the 5.5 calls per year at any of our properties. We saw something between one and 2.5 per person per year. Um, and these are properties that didn't have any, any staff there. Um, we did a really detailed analysis of the nature of those calls and would be happy to provide that to the ZBA because we think it's a good comparable. It is, in fact, housing similar folks, and we've been doing it for a long time, and we have a lot of data about that. Um, and we really did not see the severity, like you're talking about the assault and battery. We saw a lot of medical calls. We saw a lot of kind of small noise complaints, things of that nature when we went through those records. Um, I'd be happy to share that analysis with the board. Um, just also, interestingly, um, I was the one who wrote the proposal for the property in Sunderland. Um, and I will tell you that the town invested, I think, between three and four hundred thousand dollars into that project. So because they bought the land, they paid for due diligence on the land, they put CPA money into it, and then they were able to attract a developer. And do you know how many proposals they got? Okay. One. <laughs> One proposal for the senior housing in Sunderland. No, I wrote the only one they got. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> so they only got one proposal. So my only point is, it's, it's not easy to cite and fund and develop affordable housing. And municipalities really struggle with the challenge of doing that. But that proposal, they had a litany of things they wanted yes. to see done. Yes. And that yes. proposal did everything. Right. Thank you. Um, so, but, you know, they had to invest town money, which we're not talking about here today. We're talking a lot about financial cost, but we haven't talked about the cost of the town setting the table to do its own affordable housing or attract a developer to do the we kind of affordable housing at once. Affordable housing trust fund that we are able to great to do something like that. That's excellent. We have choices. Yep. Right now, I think that's excellent. I'm happy to hear it. I think all the towns should be trying to promote affordable housing. Um, it takes person power, it takes property, it takes a lot of money. So I'm. I, if you have resources, I think that's wonderful.
Peter Matusko, uh, 19 Mill Street. Uh, I'm still concerned about the vetting, uh, knowing of a lot of the, whatever the percentage of calls was with the uh, the fire, the ambulance, and the police, you know, misuse of pulling the fire stations, people, smells, smoke, and they pull the fire alarm. How many of the uses of the public services are we going to be using? That's that's one big concern. And how are you vetting them? Are you doing the full okay? Um, okay, well, there was a misdemeanor, there was a break in, there was a little bit of assault and battery. How tight are you going with the vetting of these things, knowing it's in the center of, well, not in the center of town, but where it is, where all these people and the concern of not that very far away, we're having sidewalks going everywhere. Everybody is now walking distance and the concern of all the people around the area. We are above the quota of the 10%. So why are we pushing more if we're at 12 to pushing more when everybody has been saying, why aren't the other towns doing their part? Is it just convenience because we're in the center of town? And my other question is, is what happens after so many inconvenience phone calls, all the money being used and say, this is just not beneficial, not relief to the town because we're not collecting any taxes on this for the property that's not going to be used. When's it to the point where someone says, you know what, it's not working out. Too many services being used, phone, uh, ambulance, fire, police, to the point where if this doesn't work, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, okay, one, two, three, four, five complaints, and then you finally get someone out? Or do you just say, okay, after the first or the second complaint, to keeping things safer for everybody, you know, with the vetting process, how lenient are you going to be with these people as to the uses of all of our services? And I guess my other question is, is the person that sold this to you, what happens if this doesn't work? Can this go back to a hotel? And if not, then I, I guess the question is, is how can someone that's selling a hotel, which is tax benefits to the town, can actually say you can't make it another hotel with competitive businesses and other hotels? How can they actually do that and say no more other hotels? That's to me like a monopoly. How can you not say to somebody you can't put another hotel there because it's against my own business? So I got concerns about that too. So do you want to non-compete <clears throat> when selling the hotel because the seller owns other hotels um, in Hadley? I think the point Molly might have been trying to make is there's no you can't make someone continue to run a business if they decide not to. So we've heard that there's another hotel in town, for example, that might be converted to an office use. And it would have the same impact on lodging tax revenue. So to be clear, we will pay taxes. So we will pay real estate taxes according to the assessed value of the property. So all of our properties pay real estate taxes. We're not um, a public housing authority, which is when you're on public land and you're tax exempt, we're taxable. So we would pay taxes. We're budgeting to pay taxes. We're budgeting the amount that they're paying now because that's a good starting number for us. How does that differ from what you're getting? It's the same, but it's different than the lodging taxes. So you have two kinds of taxes coming from the property, real estate taxes on the value of the property, and then a very particular kind of tax because it's a lodging, but, or, you know, restaurants give you meals tax plus real estate taxes, but there's no guarantee that anyone has to continue to use this property as a hotel. Um, you can't require them to. And so I think it's, is it the Howard Johnson's that's under review for conversion to an office facility? They won't pay lodging taxes because they're not a lodging. They won't pay meal taxes because they're not a restaurant. They'll continue to pay real estate taxes. Um, and I would be really interested to provide more information to the public and to this committee about actual data, call data from our other properties. I think it would provide some comfort to, to see that data come in. Um, we really identified almost, I think, I don't think I found any instances in our records of violent crime. I mean, I found medical stuff. I found people complaining with about trespass. I found a, a number of things, but I didn't find any. I found very few calls from neighbors. And 
I mean, they were like a handful. Um, most of what happens for folks is they have a conflict with someone else living in the same property. They call the police. And really the reason we want to staff it is because that's not an appropriate use of the police force. They don't need the police to come. They need someone to assist them mediate that conflict or find something that's lost or the elevator's broken and they need someone to call for maintenance on that. Um, so we think we can dramatically decrease those 911 calls by having staff. And I think if you call around to other police departments where there is this kind of property, they might tell you a similar tale. I, I interviewed the police chief in Northampton and, and asked her, Chief Casper, like, what can we do as landlords to reduce your call volume? And she said, it's all about staff because then there's someone there to triage the, all the minutia of problems that people might call 911 for. Um, the Amherst Campus Police said they have kids call if they want to know the time. So all of us, you know, folks who have family members to call or other resources, we don't call the police all the time, right? We call someone we know, a trusted other person. We look things up on Google. I mean, some folks don't have those resources and they end up using 911 in inappropriate ways. Um, and we don't want to prevent someone from getting like an ambulance to come if they have a medical problem, but we do want to stop the 911 calls that really could be solved by having appropriate staffing um, on site. Um, I would also mention that it, it, there are homeless people living in Hadley. They're camped out in Hadley. And there are a lot of people working in Hadley who would like to live here, who cannot afford it. And I do think aside from money and police and fire and everything, there's something to be said for that for having housing that matches the people who are you're, you're requiring because you need them to work in the services in your town. Um, anyway, I'll stop. Sure. Right, if you are. Yeah. The concern about vetting yeah. is that the demand for what you are offering yeah. is going to way outstrip the supply. It will. So you ought to be able to pick the cream of the crop right. at least for the first and then probably in to perpetuity if it is that long, because again, the demand will be incredible. Yes, we will have no shortage of applicants. So typically, um, that's right. <laughs> typically, a lease up at a property like this, we'll see maybe as many as 10 applicants for every apartment. Um, we can select people. We can't violate fair housing law. So we can't screen out people because of their source of income or their race or their anything like that. But we can still make good judgments as landlords because we don't want to have problems in our building. Like we're trying to create a safe place for people to live. If someone is unsafe, you know who they're going to be unsafe for first? It's not the charter school down the road. It's going to be the other people in the building. We feel very strongly that a lot of the folks that we house have not been in safe situations in the past. And we need to create a safe harbor for people and then they can do better than they're doing now. So um, we do have uh, written information about the tenant screening process that I could provide to the board and the board could, do you have a website or anything where you, post stuff or will we Unfortunately, okay no. <laughs> if we were to continue the hearing um as as because which i would be welcoming because i'm hearing a lot of questions and a lot of people i'm seeing for the first time and so it's a lot of information to go over um not everybody was at the board all the board meetings we went to before but we could bring a sample application we could bring um kind of how we look at quarry records we could bring our tenant selection plan it's like we have systems in place, we could share them with you. You could like them or not, but it's not arbitrary. Well, the only town that were below their quota was those town voted out and said, no, we don't want you in. Because if, why wouldn't you have Northampton and sure. Harris that are below their quota? Sure. So the percentages where I know it's yeah. convenient to have them try and have yeah. that hotel that's abandoned, but. Right. So both Northampton and Amherst are over 10%. So the property that we just permitted a few years ago in Amherst was controversial. 
Um, and the town permitted it anyway, even though they were at 10% because they had identified a need for housing for homeless individuals in their town. That was a priority for them. We went there, not everyone agreed, right? But enough people agreed that they wanted to see that happen. Northampton is also over 10%. And I would point out they're much larger communities. So that 10 or 11 or 12% mm -hmm. is thousands of units, not hundreds of units. So it's a different order of magnitude. I have done multiple 40Bs in towns like you're talking about Sunderland, Goshen, where it's under 10%. Um, and those, you know, same process that we go through. Some people like it, some people don't. Even when it's a friendly 40B, the Sunderland project, we had multiple appeals on that project from an abutter. So it's never just smooth, like everybody agrees. It's There's always some controversy around something that we do, so. Is the, is the, <clears throat> the composition of, of the tenants in this in the, in this project is is identical like is it not a different project than what you currently run in other places like is it a, is this the same type of like mix of tenants yeah. and mix of units and things like that it is so you know there are folks in the county who are advocates who recognize that we have a homeless basically crisis more and more people on the streets and would love to have seen us develop this as 100% homeless housing Champion that. Um, we believe both because of the location, because it's near so many employment opportunities for low-wage workers, and we think it's a healthier uh, social ecosystem when people, you know, some people go to work, some people don't, some people are retired, some people are, you know, in school. I mean, it, it, having the variety of people, gender, income, background, um, occupation is a healthier place to live um, instead of having everybody be coming from a homeless background. Well, you're saying, uh, how many veterans are in those rooms? Like, are you losing actually know? for those applicants having more veterans than those that are most likely the ones to be more homeless? We there there are certainly a lot of vets needing housing. Do you know Alex how many vets I don't know we can find out. I mean, there are some, we don't have any properties that are set up exclusively for vets. So they're just coming in as other applicants would come in. Um, there is a kind of uh, housing voucher called VASH uh, that if you put that in an apartment, then it only can be reserved for veterans who need it. Um, but we do see veterans, obviously, um, in our applicant pool. We see people, all kinds of people. I mean, I think you'd be surprised. Hi, my name's uh, Tony Biden, Cold Spring Lane. I'd just like to um, suggest that the that the um, zoning board vote against this tonight. I think it's the wrong project at the wrong time. We have an opportunity here because we're at twelve point six or twelve point five percent that we can be deliberative about this. We can think about this, take our time and do it right. And as, as um, we could tailor requests for proposals and if we got one, it would meet those, it would meet those uh, specifications. So we could do a much better job of it than, than we're doing here. I don't think we should be frightened into this. I'm hearing um, from some of the select board members, you know, what if, what if uh, you know, what if these drop offs, what if this happens? Well, we, that's not the way we should respond uh, to kind of be frightened into making something that may not be right. Um, excuse me. The um, the fact is that Hadley is the envy of other communities in Western Massachusetts because people talk about it all the time. We have uh, low taxes, good schools, good services. We do that because we have a business district on Route 9 that has been carefully managed by the planning board, by the zoning board over decades to um, so that all this development that has taken place on Route 9 has really paid the way. The rest of the town that a lot of people don't even know about is um, it's farms, it's houses, it's a quiet community. That's been something that's been highly successful that other communities have not had the opportunity to do. To do something like this is a dramatic shift. We have, we have rules, we have zoning that says no apartments 
for for a reason because we want to we want to keep business on Route Nine. We want to have that, and it's changed over the time. We've had malls, we've had different businesses come and go, but we've always been able to kind of change with the times and have that be a successful formula. To do this, I don't see once this happened, what is to stop it from happening to another apartment? We would have not really a um, I suppose it's case by case. We could say we're saying yes to this, we're saying no to that, but they could also sue us for saying no when we said yes. For, you know, the, I, I think it opens it opens the door um, to a major change in um, in Route Nine. If that's what we want to do, fine. But let's take our time and think about it. Let's let's plan this out. And if we're going to change Route Nine, uh, let's not do it by um, out of fear and saying. Um, we're opening this up, and um, I, I don't think that's the way to respond. Just a couple of quick points. Uh, one more point is that one of the components for this is community input, and I know that the um, that Valley has gone around to different boards, but this is really the first opportunity for a lot of us to to actually look at this and and speak about it. Some of the um, we have a we have a town meeting process. The, the select board. Is is just a you know we don't have a mayor and a town council we have different boards and we have a town meeting. Um, I don't think a lot of people know about this or have had an opportunity to really yeah. examine this. And even the select board, uh, it was not a unanimous vote. It was it was I believe three three to one with one abstention. It was so it was there's there was a letter of support, but that was not unanimous. That was a not not a clear decision at all. Mm -hmm. So. I would say reject this and let's do it right. Thank you. Um, it is often our experience that this point in time, the first opening of the hearing of the Zoning Board of Appeals is when people become aware of the project and come with questions. We do a presentation. Often there are continuances because, because of the nature of that, it being the first time that people are hearing about it. Um, I, I would just suggest that Route 9 is changing already, um, that the nature of retail and bricks and mortar is shifting. And so we're seeing all up and down the valley conversions. We're, we're working on the Northampton nursing home because it's been vacant for 12 years and converting it to apartments. There are commercial venues being convert, converted to housing because we have this glut of retail space. And so, mm -hmm. as you're saying, you know, had these been able to manage and shift with the times, there is a change in the way people buy things. And so I think reusing something that there isn't as much demand for into something that there's tremendous demand for is a smart choice. Um, I, I think we're going to see more and more of it. I think we're going to see more and more types of built environment um, converted into housing just because that's where the pressure is in the marketplace. We have, <clears throat> we have a hand up online. Uh, or do you want to say something, Rich? Uh, my hand is up. I, I, I don't know if you can you, hear me. Yeah, if you, can, you can go ahead, Felicity. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, sorry, my, my camera's not working for some reason. It was working a few minutes ago and it stopped. So it might be I have poor bandwidth. I just wanted to uh, point out that one of the advantages uh, to the to Hadley with respect to this particular project is that this site is completely developed. Um, so in in redeveloping a, a, a project that's already there uh, preserves the opportunity for the town of Hadley to um, keep its beautiful open spaces, keep um, its agricultural and, you know, village center um, areas um, without um, the prospect of having somebody come in later um, with uh, an affordable housing project that might uh, propose to redevelop um, areas that are already open now. So I think um, the board ought to be thinking about the fact that, you know, you have a, a hotel there now. We're not really changing anything that's 
um, in, in terms of the site. And there's really, I think, a pretty significant advantage uh, to the town reusing it um, in this way. And thank you for taking my comment. Go ahead, Richard. Hi, Richard Bateau, it's from uh, 20 Shattuck Road. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, voice my opinion. You know, this is my first uh, meeting uh, here and learning a lot about this process and learning a lot about what this all means. Um, but, you know, I will agree that at this meeting, we should not, you know, this should not go through at this point. Um, because, again, you know, I agree with a lot of the people that have come up, a lot of uh, fellow town citizens and said, you know, I'm learning about this today. This is my first time. Um, I don't, I also understand that we're above the threshold, which is the 10%. Um, I don't want to get into a situation that we're below the threshold because it sounds like that's not a good place to be in either. But I do know that planning for something to, you know, to give us time to think about it and then present it to the town citizens at a town meeting would make more sense because Honestly, if somebody, you know, didn't come to me and say, hey, this is coming up today, I probably wouldn't have been here and I wouldn't have known. And then if this goes through, I would have been pretty upset. So I just want to make, you know, on record that I think that this should not go through. And I think that we should come back, um, you know, learn more about this process, learn about what type of um, projects we could um, develop to, to be compliant moving forward, and then let the town decide who and where those are going to go. But yes, we shouldn't go under the 10% because then it's gonna, it sounds like it's going to be forced upon us, but it sounds like we have time. So we shouldn't move forward with something right now that is our only option. Just my thought. Thank you. Hi, I'm Melinda Nielsen, 20 Middle Street. Um, so just for my clarity, it sounds like the town is not going to have to put any money into this. The town has not been asked for any money for this. Now that the gentleman back here told me you have a pot of money and they didn't ask for some, but no, we didn't design it to rely on town resources. Okay, so um, there's the question of taxes. Can a reasonable estimate be made? Uh, like you said, we re planned or rebudgeted or refunded, but taxes don't work like, well, we're the taxpayer. We planned what we're going to pay. It doesn't work like that. Sure. So is there a way to make an estimate so people sure. know what the comparison sure. would be? Yeah. And um, I know a homeless person who has been in the system and used you know, all the different resources who would rather camp in a tent in the snow that go to nights in because it, everybody's druggies there. I mean, I don't know, but he, this is what he says. Everybody's druggies there. He'd have to be in a room with somebody else right. and he couldn't leave any of his stuff because it would get stolen. Sure. So can you please review yeah. why the people who would be right. in your Right. Uh, apartment building are not going to be that kind of person because we have just been kind of drawn, driven in tonight's in and just kind of like eyeballed like what is this that is in our town and it is not pretty. Yeah. Um, thank you. So first on the tax question, we picked up the current tax rate as as a baseline. We said, what are they paying now? Let's carry that as a budget number. Um, we could certainly, if they were willing, meet with the assessors because they as as will establish the value of the property. And they'll look at really the revenue and expenses and the cash flow of the property, and they'll back out a value for the property. Um, will it be higher? Will it be lower? That's a conversation we'll have with them. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so I don't know what's happening at the Knights Inn. Knights Inn is no longer occupied by Craig Stores. They moved out in October. So I have no idea who's staying at the Knights Inn. It seems to be right now it's just a hotel. So it's not being rented by any group serving homeless people. It's it's a hotel. So I don't when it was okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. No. Right. Um, so two perspectives. One is from the, the person you know who would prefer to sleep outside to going into a congregate shelter. So most shelters are 
congregate. People are in a room together. You can't leave your stuff overnight. You have to go somewhere else during the day. You're with other people. It can be loud. It can be noisy. It can be very stressful, especially if you have any kind of mental health stuff going on. It can be very stressful. Right. 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 We're looking to do something that is safe and secure. So it's an apartment. You have a key. It's locked. There's cameras in the hallway. There is staff on site so that it's not a free for all. There's not people getting into your room and taking your things. Um, we don't really have that happening at any of our properties. Um, but a lot of people don't want to go into shelters because they're afraid of the situation that you're describing. Um, we don't want to own and manage anything that sounds like what you're describing. We don't own and manage anything that sounds like what you're describing. So again, I keep harping back to this, you know, screening tenants, having staff on site. I mean, to us, those, those are the things that we need to do to keep the environment safe so that people won't be like, oh, I don't want to stay at that place. You know, that's creepy there. We, we, we don't want that either. The concern I have is that I feel like the town is being backed into a corner that what's the other possible use for this building other than converting it to apartment like the previous owner wrote it into the you know the non compete that it couldn't be used as a hotel you know what do we do with this building but that being said i think taking into what you guys have planned to do with it that further along what mr wato had said is that there are potential other options and potential other things that it could be used instead of kind of just saying, well, we have to do this because there's nothing else we can do. And I feel like you know, the consensus this evening is like residents feel a little bit rushed into this and that like we're at this stage now, like you said, this has been a process ongoing, but a lot of people say like this, this is happening tonight right. and what it is. And um, like I brought up the Chinese immersion school, um, you know, two doors down from here that they they have been looking and have expanded and have been looking to expand as well. Like they're a growing school. Perhaps this could be a building that they could have used. Um, yeah, I just I just feel like, you know, we're, we're kind of backed into a corner here that it's it this or then then what it just falls into the lapidation and and you know, there's no other possible use for the building. Well, it's kind of solving for a problem that didn't exist, right? It was a ongoing hotel. It wasn't a, it's not an abandoned. It wasn't an abandoned building. No. So the hotel is sold, and then they put a restriction on it that it can't be used as a hotel anymore. And then it's like, well, we have to find another use for the building. But it wasn't really a problem before what, it was sold what, with the deed restriction. What sparked a lot of the hotel changes in the hotel world was the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, just the, the hotels. The Econa Lodge is rated as a two-star hotel, so the hotels that weren't profitable in the way that some of the other hotels are in Hadley are the kind of, they're the run to the litter and the first to be cast off for more profitable locations is my, my impression. Um, I would, oh, it's very rare that we go to a 40B hearing that takes place in one night. Um, you all have 180 days to make a decision. Um, I cannot tell you what to do, but based on the number of people here tonight and the questions and comments and back and forth and requests for information, to me, it sounds like you have every right to continue the hearing and then we can provide more information. We can speak to some of the concerns that people have raised. And a 40B is always by definition kind of a negotiated process with the community. Um, the reason we call it a friendly 40B is that we have the support of the municipality in the, in the sense of the select board and some other boards that have written letters. Um, not that everybody loves it. Um, that's why it's called friendly. And like, I mean, we all drive on the Route 9 border. We see, you know, people panhandling, begging on the street. I think also a concern of mine would be that an increase in that kind of foot traffic. I mean, it's unsafe to begin with on a median, which clearly states no trespassing on it. And there's people on that begging, panhandling. Um, I would be concerned that, you know, if a lot of people um, coming here are, you know, either not reliably employed or, um, you know, rely on social services, that it may not be enough that then we could be inadvertently increasing our homeless or, excuse me, not homeless, um, uh, panhandling, begging kind of uh, 
presence along that already busy and dangerous corridor. Um, they're already here. <laughs> I also think we need to be clear about the definition of the people that will be living in here as well. I myself get confused and I find myself falling back into, you know, kind of, uh, temp you know, temporary housing or, I mean, like the way you described it from um, what Ms. Nielsen described is that, you know, these are homes, not temporary housing. I right. Think we need it's to be a pretty clear important as well about distinction. You know, again, this also begs me to want to come back and talk to you all because there's a, a large, cat there are many categories of people who qualify as homeless. Um, and it could be anybody. I mean, some of them are people displaced by natural disaster, you know, people who have unsafe housing, people who have violence in their housing, um, people who need a, a wheelchair accessible unit and they don't have one. I mean, lots of people that we could probably all say, yeah, these are people we want to help. So it's a broader category than the guy that you saw at the median by the, by the, you know, by the malls. I mean, we see that panhandling and housing aren't necessarily overlapping populations. So some people panhandle who have housing, some people panhandle who are homeless. Some people are homeless, would never be caught dead panhandling. It's it's not necessarily you have one and then you have the other. But you definitely already have. I mean, this is the thing. It's it's these issues are here with us in our society. They're here with us in Hadley. And are we gonna have more or less of it if we provide people safe, good quality housing services? Our notion is you reduce the number of people that are milling about on the street because they have a safe place to be. Yes, David. Yeah, please. I guess Doxy, a question about sure. the So Doxy, you probably know this the best. So worst case with our current housing ratio of 12 and a half percent, is it going to be five to six years before we would fall below the threshold? Or little okay. Uh I I did some calculations a couple of about a year and a half ago, we'd have to build 12 houses uh, a year in order to go beyond the 10% threshold. And it was depending on what houses come off the affordability chart. And the one we're talking about is Mountain, Mountain View, where the old Pizza Hut was, the dock in the box. And that was supposed to get a five-year extension because we repaired the water line that was broken there. And uh, we only got three. So the old town manager didn't negotiate what, what we thought we were going to get. So I would probably say it's below, to get below the 10% threshold, uh, probably about eight years, 10 years with that number. And but, now, if somebody's coming off the uh, the affordability and they want to go market rate, we have affordable housing trust fund, a CPA money plus the affordable housing trust fund that we don't know how to spend it. But if I give it to you and say, don't come off the affordability, you'll say, please, I'll take that and I'll, I'll continue the affordable housing rather than go market rate. So there are other options available to the town and the wolf is not at a door just yet. But the question is about uh, which, which ones are coming off and when they're coming off. And, and it looks like there's plenty of money out there for developers. So I don't think the wolf is at our door yet and we don't have to make that decision. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's... What I'm getting at, I guess, is we're told we have to do this. We're worried about this percentage, but the reality is there is no urgency here. We're talking about five, eight years, you know, worst case scenario. If that court case doesn't turn out, I guess you could say in our favor before we have to do something. So I would urge you to reject it and let's go about this through the town meeting process and let's see what we can do with the affordable housing trust fund rather than a very select few on a few committees 
pushing this through. Thank you. Ms. Nielsen? Um, so am I understanding that it's best for us if uh, affordable housing is affordable in perpetuity? We want it to never become unaffordable? They used to be 10 years, you know, 20 years now. I see it's 30 years that the state is demanding that it would be affordable. Settlement negotiated in perpetuity, so we will not come up. And that is to our advantage. That's what we want. If we're going to do something, maybe this, maybe not. Maybe we put out an RFP and we get well, to Well, do you want to go through this type of meeting every two years, five years, ten yeah. years? <laughs> no. Yeah. no. That's, that's the okay. So and so you were saying something about some towns have said it's got to be in perpetuity or it's got to be nine, nine years or whatever. And that can that be done with this project? Okay. Thank you. You know, again, that's always, that's a common point of negotiation with the community because the community is saying, well, you know, if you're going to do this, we want it to stay on our subsidized housing inventory for X number of years. Randy? A couple of things. Uh, you mentioned you feel like you're backed into a corner, but you're not. You have the, the decision-making power to decide where this goes. You have negotiating power with the applicant to make this happen into per perpetuity, whatever you guys decide is appropriate, if you decide it's appropriate. Um, as far as the use, the, the building, they bought it. It can't be a hotel. Is there a time limit on that? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. Let's say there, there's no time limit on it. So if this doesn't happen for them, they're more than likely going to sell the building to somebody who can put a business in there. If it's not a hotel, it's just going to generate real estate taxes, just like it will be when they own it. So, and one last thing is this housing trust fund with all this money in it, I believe right now we are at three or $400,000, Joe, do you know? About 400000 Okay, $400,000, that's going nowhere. <laughs> To, to, to create any kind of affordable housing. So just keep that in mind, please. I think Randy's referring to the shocking cost of construction and what it costs to create a new unit of affordable housing in Massachusetts, which is now running between five and $600,000 statewide. So it's true. Most towns use their money as kind of a carrot, but they can't afford to build or actually create affordable housing because it's so expensive. But to your point, Randy, and to the data that David presented is like, yes, if, if this isn't used to convert into apartments, it'd be used for a business of some sort, which then we don't have the overhead and the extra uh, calls on fire and police that are gonna come at a significant increase with housing 63 unrelated people in one building. Potential. Potential, excuse me, you're right. Um, I just, I, I struggle to see the benefits for the town of Hadley. I understand that for people to live in our wonderful community, it's a it's a, it's a a great luxury and a pleasure. And I mean, it's, it's something that, as, as someone pointed out earlier, that, you know, we've taken great care in cultivating and growing. And I think, um, you know, we're here for the, you know, for definitely what everybody in the community wants, but also what's for the best of town of Hadley. And I'm struggling to see with the points that have been made this evening as to how this project being moving forward presented as it is would benefit the residents of Hadley. There's been no provisions given for preferential placement for seniors in Hadley. There's been no preferential placement given for um itinerant or homeless people in Hadley. Um, and as Ms. Nielsen said, you know, if you build it, they'll come. I just worry that we might be bringing in more problems than we can absorb or handle. Mo Molly, you have, do you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, but just um, just to, to Jason's point about, about, you know, some of the information that's presented tonight, um, the uh, chief of police, Mike Mason, did say that if, if indeed there's a continuation 
um, if that's the pleasure of, of, of the ZBA, that you want to continue it um, so that answers to questions that were posed by the Finance Committee, for example, can be answered at a future meeting. Um, if there can be clarification on any public safety concerns, I just wanted to let you know that he did indicate that he would be happy to be present at the next meeting. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yep. Um, this is town council again. I, I just want to remind the board, you actually are going to have to continue it because if you vote to invoke your safe harbor, we have to send a letter to DHCD. The letter would say that you would, based upon your safe harbor, you would have the right to either that you may deny or you may impose conditions. Um, and then you would have to have DHCD affirm that letter before you could actually take that next vote. So regardless, you're gonna have to continue the meeting um, to a date and time certain to the applicant's point, you do ab absolutely have 180 days, which is not until August. I'm not suggesting you go until August, obviously, um, but that um, it, it would be highly unusual for a 40B application to be um, open and closed in one night. And you can't, if you're going to exercise your right of safe harbor, close the hearing tonight, you would have to continue it. Um, I would also just want to point out one other thing that you're, you're talking about your subsidized housing inventory, just to be clear. The subsidized housing inventory is calculated um, on a 10-year basis by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts based upon the decennial census. Um, sadly, uh, the 2020 decennial census numbers have yet to be incorporated into the subsidized housing inventory numbers. Uh, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And therefore, you're looking at a number based upon your market rate housing units as of 2020. So um, the 12.5%, while that is what the number is today, if your 2020 um, uh, uh, census were included in that, um, you may or may not fall below the 10%, notwithstanding the status of your other housing units. And I just wanted to make that clear just so everybody was operating off of the same facts. Um, it is likely that DHCD will not be having those numbers until mid to the end of this year. Lisa, that's the 20, it's the 2010 number that we're using? Yes, the 2010 number, excuse me. That's the 2010 number. So we need to wait to get a 2020 number anyway? You're no, you don't. You can't. You don't get to wait. You're you're using the. My point is, is that the twelve and a half percent is based upon your housing stock as of 2010, and you get to add from 2010 to date. You they they add your affordable units to that number, but they haven't added all of the market rate units that have been constructed since 2010. So, so the that ratio calculation is going that. to change. The calculation is going to change when they actually add the last 10 years of housing that you've constructed. How come all the other towns are older than us? And, we, and, and you guys are coming after our town. So you want to be with neighbors. You want to be good people. But we feel like we're, we're being, we've, we have this thing for us. We have time to think about it and with all due respect. And the other thing that's very upsetting, and the other thing that's very upsetting, I take real offense to this racist stuff. We are not racist people here. And I've about had, I don't know who wrote this letter, but you know, my mother back in the 60s threw one of our friends out because she didn't like, she thought we're all God's people. We're all God's people. We're all one to her, one love. I am so sick of this. This whole country is not going we're now we're being told that we'll be racist and we don't do this. Please stop this nonsense. We're all tired of it. Most of us. I'm not speaking for anybody else, but I'm speaking for a few minutes. Thank you for all due respect. Mm -hmm. So um, procedurally, it's not. I mean, it's not, we're not going to be able to, uh, you know, reach a final conclusion tonight. Um, you know, I would. I would. Mm -hmm. I would just kind of, I, I mean, I, 
This is an unusual hearing for our board. <laughs> We're usually dealing with people wanting to put fences closer to property lines and things like that. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think I think some of the ideas that have been kicked around here make a lot of sense to me that it's, I understand that the state law puts it to the Zoning Board of Appeals, but it seems like a weird way to decide housing policy in town to me. Um, that is That it comes down to the three of us. I know we're getting input from other boards. Um, it just, uh, you know, I'll say anecdotally, I, I haven't had I haven't had any people in the public come up to me and say anything positive about this project. Um, people in the public who've approached me have have said have told me that they don't want the project in town. I know the select board's issued a letter of interest, and I know in, you know the diversity committee is interested in it, and and you know planning boards because of the ten percent number. So I understand that the boards are interested in this, but uh, I think it's interesting that I, I haven't I haven't he heard any public support for it um, to the extent that that matters. Um, Again, this is sort of a we're typically evaluating things on this board with somewhat with an objective criteria of whether somebody has a, a hardship, whether they get a variance, whether they shouldn't have to follow our, our zoning rules for some reason. Um, and this is sort of an odd one in that it's uh, more or less like a political decision on on what's best for the town. Um, in terms of like asking us to to waive the the no no apartment rule in town and and the housing so there's two things it's the no apartment rule but it's also the housing in the industrial zone um i mean the zoning is there to protect all of us and we to to waive it when you're above the 10 percent. i think is i mean i understand that the process is there and you can do that but it, there's something that that rubs me a little bit the wrong way of of not following the zoning rules when we're already above the 10 percent um if people think we need to have a more diverse housing stock in town for with apartments or smaller units or you know it's just like when the the tiny houses came to our board i think that's a that's a matter for for the town meeting to take up for the planning board to take up with with changing the zoning bylaws to allow for some more lean some more diverse housing options um I, I don't know. I just it, this seems like a. I understand why it feels to people like this is an, a, an odd way to do this project. Is I guess what I'm getting at. Um, and I, the Valley Valley Development Corporation hasn't done anything wrong here. They're following a rule that's in place. That the it's a state rule that is in place that of how you can build this type of housing. So I'm not saying that anybody did anything wrong with bringing it forward this way. This is what the process is. Um, but it seems like it would make more sense to have more people in, giving input into this through either town meeting or, like we said, a request for a proposal where where there's more more input going into it. And I I don't see the not that it's being done on an emergency basis tonight, but I think there's plenty of time to figure this out. The the Vesta property, from what I understand, at the earliest, will be coming off the rolls in like 2032. It's just like a lot could happen between now and 2032, but. Yeah, I mean, I think we have. Yes. That's what happened tonight. It does. And then you can get more, ask for more input from other people, the other boards, to get get the numbers you're after, so to make sure that you understand exactly what what you're up against. Yeah, I would say before we move, like, uh, if we could be Laura, is it Laura? Laura, thank you. Um, I think for next time, I think. Uh, just going off of basically what I heard tonight is a, a, a what I'd like from you is a better picture of of, of who will live here um, and the vetting application process as yep. Mr. Matusko um, highlighted. Also, you said that something that kind of raised my eyebrow is that you know people go through Corey checks, but not everyone that doesn't pass a Corey check wouldn't be allowed to live there. I'd like to know what those thresholds are as well. Um, and definitely, as Ms. Keegan suggested, I would like to hear Chief Mason's input as well about how um, his uh, police officers can absorb any uh, foreseeable increase in calls and perhaps even Chief Spank Table as well, if uh, we could get their input. So will I make a motion for a continuation then? Uh, so Mr. Chair, I, yeah. I just, so you actually have to vote to oh. 
send to to invoke safe harbor as a board, you have to vote. Somebody has to move to vote to invoke safe harbor, and um, authorized me to have that sent to DHCD and the applicant. Um, and then you can move to continue to a date and time certain. So I'll make a motion right now to invoke safe harbor and authorize town council to send notification to DHCD. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then I will also make a motion to continue um, the hearing until a decided date. Or we got to pick a date. Yeah, we have to pick a date. Uh huh? Got to be a date certain. A date certain. Date and time certain. I don't know how we. What's the typical? Is it more than two well, weeks we give? Not that week. Okay. Um, give, given that we need to hear back from DHCD, you might want it to go three or four weeks. Uh, I'm going to do uh, March 20th. 20th. Does that work for everybody? Lauren, does that work? March 20th. March 20th. I will accommodate your schedule. Okay. Yes. All right. I make a motion to continue the hearing until March 20th, 2023. So as we can gather some more input and opinions. Seven, seven. At 7 p.m. Second motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much for everybody uh, coming and your input. Thank you.